you'll see it's totally appropriate. You can use the most automated thing you can imagine and you'll be fine, okay? But it's kind of like recognizing, all right, what am I dealing with here? What kind of property am I dealing with? And based on that information, um, determining how, how in depth I need to get, right? With the comps and figuring things out. The other thing is, what kind of seller are you dealing with, right? Some sellers are, they're just gonna say, hey, I hired you to tell me how much this thing's worth and I expect you to do that and I'm not gonna, if you tell me it's worth 500,000, wonderful, let's go, right? Um, other sellers are going to need you to prove to them what, what, you, what you think it's worth, okay? I get into, I think about engineers. Do you deal with any engineers? Engineers, they wanna see the data, they want you to show them how you adjusted the values and blah, 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 and all that stuff, okay? So you kinda of have to know who you're dealing with. Um, and I would also say, if you walk in and you're in relative agreement, you're basically in agreement, everybody's good with what, everybody, with what we're coming up with price-wise, shut up <laughs> and move on, right? Because this is where you can get, this is the, this will be the cause for your arguments with your sellers, okay? Pricing is, is what gets people fired up. So if you walk in and everybody's good and you, you like the number that they like and roll, let's go, right? Let's move on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But others, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to get into it with them. So um, make sure you put your email on there. And I'll send you a document that I've created. Okay. Um, so I used to, I did appraisals in 2000, oh gosh, 2002 through 2005. So I kind of got into real estate by doing appraisals. That's how I, that's how I started. Uh, so I know how most appraisers think to some degree. And I always say, I feel like if you can blend the way realtors think with the way appraisers think, you can really get a good value, okay? They both have blind spots, okay? So appraisers, they come into a house, they say, that's yeah, a four bedroom home, so I'm just gonna compare it against these other four bedroom homes. And you as an agent, you know certain four bedroom homes, like the bedrooms are tiny, or one of them's tiny, and they're barely getting that fourth one. And so how does that affect things? You know that it affects things because you walk in and show a property and what does your buyer say? Yeah, These bedrooms are small. tiny. So not all four bedrooms are created equal, right? And agents, I think, pick that up easier than appraisers. Appraisers are like, it's four beds, it's four beds, it's four beds, it's four beds, we're just gonna go with that. Does that make sense? So um, I think we want, we, I wanna show you kind of how to blend the, blend the two perspectives because I think you'll, You'll come out a lot better that way, okay? All right, my brother created this, so I'm just literally, I'm looking at it going, all right, let's see what we think. Um, okay, so price versus pricing strategy. Price, this home is worth 250,000. Uh, I know. <laughs> all right, pricing strategy. Here's why $250,000 is a great list price, right? The market knows, so you have to get used to you don't, you're not Nostradamus, you don't want to pigeonhole, like when you're in a conversation with a seller and you're talking about pricing, okay? Um, you, you don't want to die on this hill, okay? You want to be, you want to set their expectations that uh, we may need to be a little bit flexible, particularly in certain price ranges, right? Some price ranges, some locations aren't flying off the shelf. Like the house I was dealing with this morning that we got nine offers on. Nine, nine offers, right? So that's a little different uh, discussion, but you want to talk in terms of how the market, um, how the market reacts or absorbs or accepts the product that you're putting on the market. Does that make sense? So the market will like your white raised panel cabinetry. I don't like them. I mean, I do, but I, but I'm not going to say I. I love your white, you know, raised panel. The market's going to love those, or the market is not going to. They're not going to respond very well to uh, your green countertops, right? 
So we're talking in terms of how the market is the one making all the decisions and not me. That way I'm not pigeonholing myself and dying on a hill I don't need to die on. Okay? That way whenever it doesn't go as well or if it doesn't go as well, you can go back to them and say, remember how we talked about you know, we, we, we were going to pay attention to the market? We're going to price it here, but we're going to pay attention to the market and after XYZ weeks on the market or whatever it is, we were going we were going to have this discussion. So now we're having this discussion. The market's not responded. I think we need to reduce by $9,000, $10,000, okay? Guys, this is foreign territory for a lot of people right now because nobody's reducing prices hardly. It's not happening very often. But when it happens, when, when we get into a market where you will have to do this, this will become, this will become your job. So a listing agent's job in a slow market is to have a weekly conversation about the price. <laughs> Lots of fun. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. 2008, 9, 10, and into 11, if you took a listing, you signed up to have a weekly conversation about the price and why the house wasn't selling. Mm -hmm. Now, I hope we don't get to that point, um, but you got to know that at some point, things will slow a bit and you will have to have a really skilled conversation. The better, the better you are at having these conversations with your seller, the more sellers you're gonna be able to retain, the more sellers you're gonna make happy, the more sellers you're gonna get sold, that stuff, right? That's hugely important, okay? All right, so think about the market is telling us, the market is telling us, not me, not I, not Mr. Professional, I know how to interpret the market, so therefore the market is telling the seller X, Y, Z, okay? All right, so tools for pricing your listing. Flex MLS, that's the, that's, the MLS is the greatest source of data that we have at our disposal. It's the best source of data that we have. Uh, so, so don't, I would not, um, I would put that way up there. That's way ahead of these other things, okay? RPR, don't know much about it. I'm not going to talk about it. Kelly, that's an interesting thought, and that is cool. We're getting to a point now, you know, with Kelly, where you've got the snaps. That's a good, a good, very, a very quick barometer of things. If you're out in the field and you need to pull some data, not a bad deal. PVA uh, is good for a lot of things; is not so good for other things. Okay. Uh, visual assessment, obviously, uh, very, very important. Okay. Uh, the more you know areas, the better you're going to be able to advise people. Right, the better, the more you've driven around, the more homes you've seen, the more homes you've shown, um, the better you're gonna get at pricing on the fly. So what I wanna do is I wanna teach you how to do this really well so that you can move beyond it and be able to do this faster, right? Because at first, like if you really take your time and get to know some things, it's gonna take some time to do these well, but the more you do, the the more comfortable you're, you'll get, the more confident you'll get, right? Most of it's about confidence anyway. How did you say what you said to the seller, right? Where they take you seriously and they, and they look at you as a professional, okay? Uh, so the more you know, the more knowledge you have of streets and dividing lines and where the railroad tracks are and where the nuclear waste dump is and where the highway goes through my backyard and all those things, those are hugely important things, right? Um, that really affect value. And they're not changeable. You can't change the fact that the highway goes through your backyard. So what do we do about that? We gotta make an adjustment. We gotta figure out how, how much is this gonna affect us, right? So anyway, all right. Any questions so far? Anything? No? Okay. So, I think he stole my sheet. This is good. Good job, my bro. Good job. All right, so finding your comps. All right? Um, the number one thing in real estate is location. I realize it is a cliche, but it is the number one thing far and away that, that controls everything, okay? Uh, the closer you can get to your location with your comps, the better. And anybody who says differently doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay, so now that doesn't mean that you can always find perfect comps right near your subject, you can't. And so that's where you have to take some liberties and learn how to move, move beyond that a little bit. But for the most part, I was talking to somebody the other day and 
um, they were having an issue with a, a deal and the listing agent had priced this property like way off and the buyer's agent made the offer because it's such a hot market and they've lost so many they didn't really even look at the comps they just gave them full price well guess what the appraisal came way low way low and the listing agent was mad because the appraiser this is so funny you'll laugh i hope you'll laugh because the appraiser only used comps right in the subject neighborhood you're not laughing why aren't you laughing that's funny right um and, he, and what he said is true if i don't need to go outside the neighborhood i'm not going outside the neighborhood if i've got enough data in the neighborhood why would i go outside the neighborhood okay now if you don't have enough data in the neighborhood that's when you have to go outside the neighborhood to get your comps right make sense so this this listing agent was just beside herself because yeah the appraiser stayed in the neighborhood how dumb is that okay so all right some things to think about watch for major boundaries this is really important so if they're on a busy road that affects the value right if you're on uh, the railroad tracks or close to the railroad tracks that affects the value if you're in anchorage you're close to the railroad tracks and those are still expensive homes so it's not the end of the world for some areas but anchorage is one of those weird places where they don't really care they don't seem to care much but i will i will say you will find that the houses that are closer to the railroad tracks are going to suffer a little bit in value okay make sense um the beautiful thing about this is when you're doing your cma if you're pulling up the map view, if you don't know the area well, you're going to be able to see railroad tracks. You're going to recognize, oh, that's the Waterson. <laughs> and it's in my subject's backyard, right? So you're going to notice these things, okay? So pay attention to the maps if you don't know the area as well. Um, I'm trying to think what else would be a negative. Golf course could be a positive or a negative. Kind of depends on where, uh, where you sit on the, on the uh, golf course, right? If you're in a landing area, if, you, if you're showing the house and there's a big net in the backyard, like, you might want to talk about that, right? So, um, yeah, and people do. They, they steer clear of that stuff. They're not going to buy it, so it's going to shrink their market. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, you know, airport proximity or, or planes flying over left and right. Um, what else do you think? you think of anything else that's a nuisance? Construction. Construction going on. Yep, yep, yep. What else? Sewer treatment plant. Sewer treatment plant could be an issue. Yeah, yeah. What else? Power lines. Power lines. Yeah, big power lines going. Yeah, big, the big dogs. Or the big hole in the yard. Right, right. Um, what about a 70 unit apartment complex next door? Well, I was going to say that was kind of a construction yard. Mm -hmm. But that's just a lot of people, and people don't. The market does not respond well to property, to homes located in close proximity to large apartments. Now, you've got exceptions to that. You've got neighborhoods where that's sort of expected. So that, there's, there's, that, that doesn't seem to affect it as much. But some of the stuff being built, I mean, there's so many large apartment complexes being built that, you know, some people are going to protest against, uh, against you know, moving into that scenario. Um, what else? Anything you can think of? Nuisances? Flooding, low-lying road. Okay. Like if there's noticeable standing water in places, maybe on the property or... Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. Okay. Different sides of the street could create different conditions. Yeah, for sure. So Zorn Avenue on the... St. Leonard, I think it's the street or the, the church and school there. Uh, that side sells for a very, very reasonable price for the zip code. The other side of Zorn Avenue is Mockingbird Valley. It's the highest price real estate you can find pretty much, right? They're divided by Zorn Avenue. Don't know why, don't, don't really care, just, just saying. It's just true whenever you're going in there. So just know your boundaries like when you're looking at different, different sides of the street, okay? Um, sometimes you will need a full zip code search. Sometimes you'll need a full county search. Sometimes you'll need to go five miles away, right? We're talking about density, okay? So how dense is the area that you're looking? How much does it turn over, okay?
okay? If it's a rural area, you're gonna have to go further out more than likely. Now, the rule is still get as close as you can to the subject, but it's perfectly acceptable to have to search the entire county when you've got a property on 25 acres, okay? So it's fine, right? Or stay in the zip code if you can. I mean, you want it to be the smallest circle possible, but you gotta get comps. Make sense? <clears throat> All right. Uh, search auction, wow. I didn't search auction, but that's cool. I would search active, pending, and closed, uh, depending on how dense, dense the area is. Uh, I, would, I would search those three categories for sure, but depending on how dense the area is, is how far back I would go. I, sh I should not, I hope I don't have to go back a whole year to get good comps. If I can stay within six months, I'm gonna stay within six months. If I can do, if I can go down to like a third of a mile instead of a half a mile, I'll do that and maybe stay at six months, okay, to get really super close to the property, um, that sort of thing, okay? Do you, do you like to do active ones mm -hmm. and close with active Yep. Ones? Depending on the market you're in, you're gonna to need to look at active. I think I think your, your market, you're always, well, and really what we should have on there is active, active under contract, pending, and closed, mm -hmm. okay? Um, What's hard with that AUC being like? I don't know what AUC, oh, active under contract, thank you. It looks like auction to me. I don't know why I'm thinking of auction, that's stupid. Okay, yeah, see, good job, Joe. <coughs> so, um, but he didn't have actives on there, which I would. You need actives on there for sure. Um, they, they even started adding actives into appraisals because the underwriters wanna know, they don't wanna just know what's happened in the past, right? So think about the data that you collect. An appraiser usually uses closed sales. That means that, that stuff's already happened, right? So they're looking backward to make a determination of value. The underwriters eventually said, no, you know what? So especially in a declining market, okay? So when a, when, a, when a market is declining, what do they wanna know? They wanna know what stuff's selling for. What is on the market currently, right? Does that make sense? So, because you could get some, when the market shifts a little bit more, you'll start to see it. The historical data, the closed sales will show, hey, it's worth 300,000. But then you pull up the actives and you're going, man, the median price in the neighborhood is at about 280 or something, okay? So that could be, that can be, that can be super problematic if you, don't, if you don't think in those terms because you're gonna be advising a seller. And the hard part is when you know the market's shifting a little bit, and you can't prove it with closed data, you gotta prove it with something. Because you can't just say, hey, in my gut, I already know, I just know, Mr. Seller, I know it's getting slower, we need to price it at this point. You can't do, they're not gonna believe you, right? So I gotta show them something that gives them an idea of what's actually happening. So I can show them the actives, and I can show them that those prices are down, and so I think we're gonna need to be down as well from what these closed, you can, you can spin it with, um, you know, the good news is, the appraisal ought to be fine because the back because they're going to be using closed sales, right? Um, we should not have any issues there. Okay. Yo. Uh, okay, so in the example you gave earlier, you mm -hmm. said that the appraisal used comps outside the or in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. not outside. So which one is better? Used outside the neighborhood or inside? The neighborhood? Inside. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. What the what the listing agent wanted the appraiser to do was to ignore everything inside the neighborhood and just go outside to get comps, which. Yeah. That ain't gonna happen, right? When, when location is the most important thing, the closer the better, okay? If you can get it. All right, so, so search, okay, we're gonna use the uh, polygon, so, yep. When you, when you make the decision to leave the neighborhood and go to, like, because obviously you said start out in six months, so if you're in that neighborhood and not much is sold in the six months, do you go back a year or do you- I'd rather go back, that's a good question. I'd rather go back further in time to stay hyper, hyper local than to get outside the neighborhood. I'd rather go back a year. The chances are you're gonna find, so let's say you've got two really good comps in the neighborhood, right, that have closed and maybe one active and maybe a pending. That's almost enough, almost, if they're really good, if they're really like, if they're very similar to what you've got, you know, what your subject looks like, that's, a, that's almost enough data to do something with it. You don't really need much more than that. 
But if you really want to be certain, maybe you go outside the neighborhood, just to an adjoining neighborhood, and pick up an active in another closed sale or something, and just say, hey, and just see what the price differences are. Is that affecting it downward? Is it affecting it upward? What's it doing? Uh, and then you can talk to your seller about that and say, you know, here's, here's where I'm coming from. But just know that the appraiser, if they gotta go outside the neighborhood, they're gonna be doing that too. And they may go outside the neighborhood before going further back in time because the underwriters tend to like, they like, they like closer close sale in terms of um, date, range. Uh, date range. Yeah, they wanna, they wanna know what's happened recently. Um, okay, so today we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna use the uh, polygon <coughs> drawing tool. Uh, we use a zip code search and you do a neighborhood search. On this stuff, I think it's great to use a neighborhood search if my rule on a neighborhood search is, is there a sign out front of the neighborhood that tells you what the neighborhood is, right? Because there's a bunch of old neighborhoods in Louisville where there's not a sign. No one's gonna tell you you're in excellent place. That's where I used to live, excellent place. There's no sign that says that. Um, so I'm not sure how beneficial it would be for me coming to my house to just search excellent place, right? For one, I gotta trust that the agents, and you can't, actually knew that it was an excellent place, okay? Um, so now if it's Lake Forest, that's a different issue because Lake Forest is so diverse in, in, the, uh, in the value spectrum that I don't think you can just go in and say Lake Forest. But I'll give you a really good example. My favorite example is Springview. You guys know Springview? Mm -hmm. It's kind of in J-Town. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it, I think it was a Dominion neighborhood, Dominion Homes neighborhood. So. The floor plans, the home, uh, oh, you've got one in there. Floor plans, quality of construction, all that stuff is relatively similar. And you can type in Springview and you'll always have a good amount of data. Okay, you don't need to use a polygon or a zip code or uh, radius search or any of that. You can just literally focus on Springview. Does that make sense? Yay, no? Okay, all right, uh, what else here? Select comps with similar style, size, and updates. So uh, style could be a ranch, a two-story, a bi-level, a tri-level, okay? This is real, it's really important to stay within the style, okay? That's probably the, that's, that's the first thing I'm looking for. That's the first thing I want whenever I'm looking at comps, okay? So if I've, if I've got a ranch, I really, I, if you're, if you're comparing a two-story to a ranch or vice versa, you don't have good data. You don't have good, a good amount of data. You need to go find some ranches, um, okay? Because it really makes a big difference. Uh, Bi-levels and tri-levels and quad levels and all that one and a half stories. Like if you have, let's say you've got, um, the only time you might deviate, like if you've got a ranch and you're in a neighborhood where there's not a lot of ranches, but maybe there's some one and a half stories and it's, they've got first floor masters, then you can, you can somewhat use those, okay? It's not ideal, but you can. The first floor master thing's hugely important. You wanna have like kinds there. Does that make sense? Because people will just not even look at stuff that doesn't have a first floor master. So it does, it does affect the market quite a bit. All right, uh, size is important. So I always go with, uh, above grade square footage is the is where I start, okay? So I'm looking at style, and then I'm looking at above grade square footage, and of course bedrooms. If I can, I will, there's, there's times where, I mean, you really wanna stay, obviously if it's a three bedroom, you wanna compare it against a three bedroom. If it's a four bedroom, you wanna compare it against a four bedroom. But there are times when I think that's less important. If you're in, if you're in an older neighborhood, like I think of St. Matthews, like um, there are four bedroom Cape Cods in St. Matthews that are tiny, little cracker boxes, okay? I don't think that matters. Like if I've got a nice three bedroom versus that four bedroom that's all crushed in there, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry about it being three versus four. Does that make sense? If I'm in uh, Owl Creek though, and I've got a three bedroom versus a four bedroom, that's a different ball game because Owl Creek, those four bedrooms were built that way. In St. Matthews, those were built as glorified two bedrooms that somebody's gone in and added a wall and now you've got four bedrooms. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work well, okay? So you, you, 
you definitely have to pay attention to bedrooms. You want to be the same, but you can move around a little bit if, if, if it's, the way I look at it is no, a four bedroom should not be 1600 square feet or less above grade. And there's plenty of those in St. Matthews, right? Okay, that's what I'm saying. All right, so size, so above grade square footage, bedrooms, bathrooms, basement. Um, basement's a big ticket item. So if, you're, if your property does not have a basement, you really want something that doesn't have a basement if you can find it, it's very important. Uh, but if you can't, you can't, and you're just gonna have to make an adjustment and it's gonna be pretty substantial. And then you're gonna look at updates. So you're gonna look at pictures, right? You're gonna look and see what does it look like? How updated does it look? Does it look like something the market would absorb well, quickly? Do they like it? Is it the stuff on HGTV, right? Is it, not that I ever even mention that, that TV station, uh, with any joy, but is it stuff that's selling, right? People like it generally. Um, okay, makes sense? And that's gonna be super, like, you get into like trying to figure out making an adjustment for updates, you really have to just trust your gut to some degree um, and make a decision on what you think the market is gonna do. If you have a dated grandma house, as I call it, right? and You've got, a comp, you've got comps that are all updated, you're gonna to have to make some decisions on, on how to price that, okay? And you're gonna to have to make, it's gonna to have to be discounted, but how much and why? And not necessarily based on the cost to remodel, we know it'll be less than that. Right. Homes will sell, they won't, you're not gonna get that full, now they might end up getting the full amount that they put into it, but when you're pricing something that's a little bit dated or whatever, they're still gonna sell for in, a, in a, you know, in a, an established area that people want to be in, it's still going to sell for a little more than probably it should, if that makes sense, based on what you got to do to it. All right, cool. Anything else? Any questions about that? Yeah, I have one question on uh -huh. the updates. Um, in your experience, when you have a house that's been interior, looks great. Yeah. But the AC is 20 years old. Oh yeah. The roof is older. So, you know, does it just depend on the people that are buying the house? It kind of does. Um, what I see on that is people get all excited because cosmetically it looks gorgeous and then they get the inspection because they didn't pay attention to the disclosure and maybe their agent didn't say, hey, you know, look, this thing's really nice on the inside, it's really beautiful, but I do need you to know you've got some big ticket items probably in the first five years, right? So roof, HVAC, uh, windows, maybe something, something where you know you're going to be spending a bunch of money, um, and if they're not educating them that way, then they're liable to, you know, see the actual guts of the property and get out. So determining what the value is, I I just look at like the mechanicals as like a little bit of a, a piece of the puzzle, but I can't really determine. I'm not going to say you know if you've got the roof and the uh, HVAC that are updated that you're going to get. You know, it's going to cost you every bit of sixteen, twenty thousand, probably for those two things. I'm not going to say you're going to get that much more. You're probably not. So it's kind of determining. What's the appraiser's perspective on that versus ours? They they note it, but I don't think they. Okay. So so they'll note it. And they'll they'll say something like, "Okay, great." I mean, I just had a, I, I just had a bunch of investment properties appraised the other day, and I'm talking to the appraiser the whole day. I mean, I was with this guy for six hours. So I'm talking to him, I'm picking his brain and asking him these things. And I could tell, like, cause, and I would even say, like, I told him, hey, you know, we had to rebuild this garage. I mean, does he really care about that? Like, I sounded like a stupid seller, like when, seriously, like I sounded like a seller that you walk into and they start bragging about everything that they did because that's just human nature. We like to brag about it. <coughs> he noted it, he was very nice. He's like, no, I need to know that. I'm glad you said that. I'm like, yeah, like it either has a garage or it doesn't, right? Um, I don't think, I don't think it's, I, it might, it might, it might be the, like if you've got updated mechanicals and, a, and everything else is beautiful and the value is, let's say it's got multiple offers and the value is not really there based on comps, maybe they're gonna give you the benefit of the doubt a little bit more because you got the whole package, so to speak, right? But. Yeah, I can tell you, we just had a house appraised um, 
able to refinance so that they could cash out so my client could buy that the house was a quarter unit, like literally a yeah. quarter house, and it appraised for fair market value for that quarter. So I don't think they, they didn't care to be yeah. sticky and filthy and gross. But you're, you're, right. yeah, you're, you're, you're saying that. But, that but that it's also, real quick, every appraiser is different. Yeah. That's okay, the challenge, shame. you know, and like, it's an opinion of value. Like an appraisal is an opinion of value. So we all know about opinions mm -hmm. and other things. Everybody's got one, right? <laughs> so um, you just have to keep that in mind. But you're right. I mean, some of them are gonna walk through and they're gonna see a certain amount of either deferred maintenance or like filth or whatever. And they're just gonna be like, ah, you know what? They're gonna put, the, if they put this on the market, they're gonna clean that up. So I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. And others are gonna be like, man, I have to appraise this thing as is, where is, and the way it sits today is the way that I have to appraise it. So can you talk a little bit about providing comps for the appraiser? Mm. For example. Should you or should, should you or yeah. what? Well, yes, and how to go about that if you do. Yeah, I would be, <clears throat> they kind of have, they kind of think they're smart, a lot of them, <clears throat> these appraisers. Like they kind of think like they you, they don't need your help. Mm -hmm. But I also have heard some of them say, you know what, I really appreciate when the agent, you know, some of them will say even shows up at the appraisal, which I don't know that I would do that necessarily. I mean, if, you, if you've got a big deal and you know that it's intricate and you have a very strong opinion and you had to go get certain data that you really think the appraiser in their everyday appraising, they might not have, they're not going to go get this particular stuff. I absolutely would show up and say, hey, you know, um, I just wanted to provide you with some of the research I did because this is a big listing and, and I'm, I'm using a big listing because lack of a better example. Um, and, and here's some things that, you know, I'm not sure would turn up in just everyday kind of uh, research. I wanted to provide that for you and I put the comps in here that I use. And the way I would put it, Kendall, is I'm, I'm providing you with the comps that I used when I priced the property, it, just to help you. And then, just to And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I, I just, I don't think you want to go into much more than that. I do think every time you get multiple offers, if you're a listing agent and that appraiser doesn't know that, you're not doing your job. They need to know that. And it doesn't always make the end all be all difference. But when they call or they schedule it through showing time and you think, oh, I don't have to really talk to them because they're just going to let them themselves in. No, call them or email them and say, hey, you know, we had four offers. We had one at, you know, even higher than this, but this one's better terms. I mean, go into that with them. And I think it'll, it, will, it should bolster the benefit of the doubt, which is what you need right now. I mean, really what we need right now is kind of a benefit of the doubt boost in a lot of cases. Does that help? Yeah. Or what else are you asking? Well, I'm just curious. Um, I'm thinking of an example that I had where the, I was representing the buyer, mm -hmm. so that's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but the appraiser used comps that were in a neighborhood, and the property was on 44 acres. And so, we what we ended up doing was is it a neighborhood of 44 um, acre homes? Of course not. <laughs> Um, so what we ended up doing is both buyer and seller agreed, and lender agreed to throw that one out. And I think the seller, I don't remember who, one of our parties, I think the seller paid for a new one. Okay. Because that guy kind of, he refused to change anything. Yeah, right. And so I kind of want to know, representing either side, mm -hmm. how you might, I know this isn't really a CNA, but it kind of goes to yeah, it, no, right? Cool. Yeah, whatever. So how, um, how would you um, support your client, support like, worth way more than what he had, obviously. Um, right. So it's just, it, I just... Well, I think that's part of it is, can I get a hold of the appraisal so that I can see that it's truly an error and really a bad appraisal, right? Right. Because if it is, then it's not doing my buyer any good, even though I'm representing the buyer, right? So in a way, because I always, this is a struggle, because, right, I mean, the appraisal comes in low, well, if you're representing the buyer, why, why are you fighting for the, for the seller? Right. <clears throat> but if it's a truly bad it report, truly bad. then that doesn't do anybody any good. And what you did is perfectly, perfectly fine. I mean, having everybody come together and say, hey, this is garbage. Let's, let's redo this. And I, I leave it up. I mean, on a buyer, when I'm representing the buyer, I talk to the buyer and say, hey, look, we're short 
sometimes, a lot of the time, unfortunately, it's like you know four grand. It's not a ton of money, but it affects the deal, right? Mm -hmm. So I go to them and I say, hey, look, we're short four grand. Um, I can get a copy of the appraisal and I can work on attempting to get that appraiser to raise that value, but I need to know from your perspective, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, is that what you want me to do? Or do you want me to go to the seller and say, hey, look, we're, we're not buying it for more than it appraised for. We're going to buy it for that amount or we're, we're out. How do you want me to proceed? Because you kind of want to know. I mean, they might say, no, I, because it's 100% financing or something, right? So right. they're going, no, I need you to fight for me. I want you to get the 4000 We need that. Okay, well, then I'll do my best. Um, does that make sense? It does. So the only other like lingering question is, is can the buyer agent do anything towards is it okay for them to also like to provide their own stuff to the list agent and appraiser? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, they some for some reason, uh, and I think Carrie said this recently. Um, people think that agents can't talk to the appraiser. That's not true. You can talk to the appraiser. For one, they're probably going to have to go through an agent to get access to the property anyway, and you can totally talk to them. Okay. The lenders, lenders, allowed. it's a little bit. A little bit more yeah. tricky it depends on what lender it depends on what the loan type is and all that jazz so um, yeah so I know I definitely think it's appropriate to send your comps and to talk to the appraiser let them know about the multiple offers Marshall I have a question when you when you are first going to a buyer talking to I mean talking to a seller about their home mm -hmm. do you try to get an idea of what they are looking for or what Yeah, I do. I'm not saying I've done that really well a lot. Sometimes I won't do that, but I do think it's smart to kind of know what their temperature is because yeah. why are you even going out there if you're so far apart and it's not going to work? Right? So I would want to know just so that I know where they stand. That doesn't at all affect how I'm going to come down on it because I know and I've had too many listings not sell in my lifetime to know that I'm signing up for a weekly conversation with a seller who doesn't want to drop their price and that's the thing that they need to do and I don't want to have that weekly conversation. I don't have time. Why do we have time for that? Right? And I'm not saying that there aren't instances where, you know, you're going to you're if you are if you're doing a farm property or something like that is just really Stupid. different, yeah. then yeah, the values are going to be a lot less certain. So I'm going to give those a lot more benefit of the doubt, you know, and just tell them, hey, you know what? I'm doing these value assessments all the time. And if somebody, and I've, I've literally said this, I've said this to many sellers. If somebody walks into your house and says they know exactly what it's worth, you should throw them out on the street because they don't know because this, this isn't a cookie cutter product. It's, it could be this, it could be that. I'm gonna, we're going to make sure that we put it in the right value segment so that it sells, right? So my job is now to be within whatever, it depends on the price point, but it might be to be within 25,000 of kind of where you think it's gonna hit. That might be a perfectly acceptable and fine, knowing that you're gonna be talking to them about dropping it if it doesn't sell, right? Does that make sense? Well, in cases like that, I like to get a price reduction. You like can do that, yeah. yeah. I mean, more power to you, yeah. You get a price reduction when you sign the listing. Yeah, yeah when you're saying, hey, we're going to price it at 550 but, you know, in, in a month or whatever, we're going to be at 525 That's great. Can you add language in your listing contracts or in, like, an addendum or whatever that basically, like, you're going to accept what the appraisal says and we're not, like, if it's a couple thousand dollars off, you agree to lower it to the buyer? Or is that not even worth it? It's hard. It's hard to like put. It's hard to. You don't know what it's going to come in at. You know what I mean? And doesn't that also so I mean, you could put something as long as you're specific. As long as you're like, hey, if the appraisal comes, you know, comes in within, you know, twenty five hundred of X, mm -hmm. we're moving on. 
You could, yeah, I think you could. I think they depend on. But I think you want to be careful. You want to make sure it's a net amount. Like you want to sure, think about they're going to have be super attractive to sellers, but still curious if there's a way to have a conversation and kind of codify it at the beginning. I think you, but I also think like when it happens and it comes in low, some sellers are just they're just bullheaded. You're not going to you're not mm -hmm. getting anywhere. Um, but a lot of them, even if they seem kind of bullheaded, they're kind of like, I mean, it's a stark thing. Like, okay, you're either gonna, you're either gonna play ball here. Maybe, maybe the buyer's gonna come up a little because they can. They got enough money, they can do that. Or you're gonna come down a little. We're gonna meet in the middle, or you're gonna have to sell it for what it's, whatever. But the bottom line is like that's a, like that's a reality check, because they don't want to put it back on the market at that point. Right. You're already through inspection, so they're probably starting to move. Most of them are gonna have at least a modicum of, you know. Of, uh, of common sense at that point, where you so hopefully get something done. I just, wait. I just wait. I now I, I mention it. I mention it. I'll tell them like sure. when we go under contract, I'll say, hey, you know, remember when we did our CMA and I showed you what the comps are? The market's hot. We've got multiple offers. This thing's going for ten over asking, and the data does not reflect that. So be written. So be ready. We we could get lucky. It could go through. But we may not, and we may be having a discussion. Okay. I just set their expectations. It's always setting their expectations. Sure. I do a seller net sheet with what I'm going to list it for, and then try to get, try to find out what their bottom line number is, and then go below their bottom line number and say, okay, this could be your reality. Mm -hmm. And if you're okay, you know, sign, you know, I haven't signed it, I've yeah. discussed it with them because it's not just the price. You got to look at. So how often does anyone give them a or talk to sellers and give them an appraisal before they list? Or can they even have I would I, it doesn't matter like it's irrelevant to the deal that's coming in. Like because the lender is gonna hire the appraiser. So you don't know who the lender is because you don't have the deal yet, right? So in that regard, you're not saving a step. Now if you have a super unique property, like that's when I would get, the only time I would get an appraisal done ahead of time is if I've got a unique property. And I need to set these people, like they think they have gold. <clears throat> so they've got the gold floors, and but it's not gonna be marketable and it's not worth what they've got in it. It's nowhere near that, right? I need them to have a reality check. So I'm gonna tell them, hey, you gotta get an appraisal. Here's the name of the person that knows knows these kinds of properties. That way you can set a price that you think actually has a shot. Otherwise and you said you're gonna have a big headache, right? So but here's the thing, even if you get it appraised ahead of time, the lender more more than likely ninety five percent of the time is gonna have to have a new appraisal. So you're not saving a step, but you might be you might be getting your, your seller right in their mind by doing it. If it's if it's a even if it's a tough property to uh, assess, for me, I'm gonna probably do it. I'm not gonna pay it, or I'm not gonna have them do an appraisal. But if it's super unique, and they're given, and I can already tell, like they think it's worth. I mean, I'm thinking like you know they think it's worth four million dollars. Well, there's there's not many four million dollar properties in our market, so I'm already going eh, right. I'm gonna I'm gonna get an appraisal because they may be two million off. You see what I'm saying? Like if they're that far off, they need to know it. And it can come from somebody else and not me. And then maybe I can keep the listing if they if they take some constructive criticism. Kendall, one more question, we gotta move on. I totally lost it, it's good. Good, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you remember it, tell me. All right, uh, if you guys have your laptops, let's go ahead and do this, okay? Let's get laptop. Um, and open up Flex. What's he want us to do? All right, so we're going to do a map search. So go in to map search. 
Does everybody know how to get there? If you don't, don't be shy. Just say it. It's fine. You're fine. It's a safe place. So go into map search. Okay. Make sure you're in um, residential. I guess I don't know. I've got my own search that I made. So residential is where you want to be. Okay. But um, map search. Everybody got that? Seriously. You didn't? Okay. All right. So down here, you see the pin? Lower right hand corner. Um, Can you give us the address? Uh, Will. Will, right? Yeah. Yes. You called Joe earlier. Too. No, I, no, that was Joe. I was talking to my brother who isn't here. Oh, okay. Because he was like, Cousin? Joe. <laughs> no. All right, so Will, what's your Springview address? 4008 Mimosa View Drive. Mimosa. View Drive, DR Louisville, KY 40299. Okay? You guys got that? You got your pin? Search. You dropped your pin? What was it again? It's 4008 Mimosa. Sound good? Mimosa. View. Mimosa. DR. Mimosa View. Mimosa View, two words. Drive. Yes, DR. Oh, it's a Louisville, Kentucky 4299. So then you, you hit yes, and then you're going to see um, use this location. You see, use this location. If you have that click here thing, get rid of that. Okay. If you, you need to get that, there's another bub. Mine was doing that too. I had a bubble over top of where it is. Get rid of that, then just hit use this location. All right, then you get a little. Where does it say that? Uh -huh. That's probably because you got that other bubble up there. Did yours work? No. Did you do the Did you do the pin? Oh. I did the pin. And then it's uh, four zero zero eight four zero zero. Mimosa M I M O S A. And then view, and then D R. Who needs something? Sorry. I did. You got it there. It is. Okay. Uh, wait. Okay. Well, Are you in? Okay. Yes, sir. You're in that. Click that and see if it'll get rid of that. Okay, go back. No? Do, okay. Do radius. Click that. Yes. Using the map search. Let's do another pin. Do the pin again. Okay, go back in and do the same thing. Sorry, 4008. I'm sure there's a better way to do that, but I don't really know what to do. Mimosa View Drive, DR. 4029. Little KY. Everybody got that? Map search. Yes, you good? Now, why is that? Okay, so now use this location. You see that? And then we're going to have radio search. search. Huh? You said pin, not pen. 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 The Kentucky pen. Pen. <laughs> All right, so radius search. Okay? Now, this is Springview. Like I said earlier, if we wanted to, we could just search Springview. That'd be fine. We probably will do that in a minute. But I would do a, I do, I, so radius search, mine pops up at one mile. That's what it says. I don't want one mile. I want, I want 0.5. Okay? I'm going to put 0.5 in there, I'm going to hit create radius, and then it's going to turn everything blue. Right? You guys following it? Uh, no. No? No. <laughs> the hmm? I searched the wrong way. Uh, I could, but then I won't be able to read that. <laughs> okay, so here's what you do. 0.5 miles? Get rid of that. Go here. Four zero zero eight. Okay, I'm still in. Oh, no, I'm just looking at what was. Mimosa, M I M O S A. View. Drive. I see it right there. Chris, can you share this presentation? Uh, yes, I think so. Okay, awesome. And actually, I have a document that I'm going to send you that I created about this stuff. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Well, this would be at point five. Point five. Point five. Nerf. Okay. We got it. Use this location. Yep. Okay. 
and then radius search. And then get rid of that 1.0 and put 0.5 in there. And then create radius. Turns your screen blue, right? Okay. Everybody at that place? Okay. Now, you're going to go. He says to zoom out and decide what you already know about the area. So if you want to zoom out, this is a good exercise to do, okay? You're going to zoom out a bit and look for stuff, right? What am I looking for? Positive and negative influences. That's what I'm looking for, right? Positive influences could be like this, the proximity to Jefferson Town Veterans Memorial Park. That's a good thing. I would think, for the most part, most people would like to be near a park. Okay. Um, now this is this is like more if I didn't have a bunch of data within the neighborhood, I'd be looking at positive. Or if I didn't know the area, I'd be like, oh, okay, that's cool. Um, really, there's nothing there's nothing much more that's scary or overly positive for where we sit. Okay. What's that? Yeah, that could be. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. It very very well could be, but I don't see any. I don't see railroad tracks. We're not on a real busy area. It's not a busy street. Okay, it's a neighborhood. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're it's relatively vanilla, so to speak. Like there's really nothing positive or negative. All right, so uh, pay attention to major boundaries. We we're, we've probably got better uh, uh, better examples than this. Okay, and he's used an example in St. Matthews for. Uh, Homes on Fairlawn Road between Willis Avenue and Lexington Road carry a higher property value than the same homes on Fairlawn Road between Lexington Road and Frankfurt Avenue. Okay, so that's a nice, that's a that's an example. Okay, note any other physical or functional obsolescence. Whoa, it's a big word uh, in the area. Power plant across the street. No access to highways. Fall brick or fallway uh, backyard uh, on one side of the street. Okay, any of that stuff. Okay, this is we're good. We're good. So we've got we've got our area selected. Okay, now look, I don't know about yours, but mine mine defaults to just show actives. Is yours just showing actives? Yes. You know how to look at that? You look on your your search your search bar or your feature bar on the left and it says status. Uh -huh. And all I've got is active. Yeah. Okay? Alright, so and then if I look up it says view results and how many do you have? See that? Just look up. Don't click anything. Just look at the screen as it is. You see view results? No. It's on the top of your feature bar on the left. Oh boy. I just want to make sure you guys even have that. If you don't, then so you've got view. Oh, it doesn't? Mine doesn't matter. Oh, okay. So yours doesn't default to that. So come down to status. Can you click on that? Yeah. Click there. Where's the Why is it not doing it? What's it say? Please enter a city city What? I don't understand why that's doing that. Um Get out of that. You, you don't want that. Okay. As soon as I exit the address, so I'll let it run. But did you do your circle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it a half mile? Oh, view results. There it is. I had to exit out of the address. We just want active. Okay, well, you don't need to put the address in that bar. You need to put it in. I don't know why I would have put it in there. Let me see, Glennis, if yours is the same. That's what happens when you put it in that bar, then it shows only one. Uh, you put it here. No, that's what it is. Click, click that X. That's, that's what Will does. So now you're able to go in there and get your status of active. Okay? You guys got it? So eight 
So here's the thing. What I like about that results thing, that see results, is I like to see, I like to look at that and I want to get that to a workable number of, of uh, properties that I can uh, go into more detail on, okay? And see which my best, which which are my best comps, okay? So if you're in active only, you've got a kind of a small number. So we're going to do what? Remember, we're going to pick active. We're going to pick active under contract. We're going to pick pending and closed. Do you guys know how to do all that? So you click on status, and then you go active, and you have to click your like your command or your or your control, depending on what kind of computer you have, and select all those. You guys got that? Well, I would just go through them individually. You can actually do them all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I know. So yeah, you, so you know how to do that? Okay. So you're gonna do yes, control, and then click active under contract. You already got active. Don't no, don't click that. Now click active again, just by itself, just by itself. Then come down to active under. Scroll it down just a slight bit. Oh, you can do that too. going to give you this, you're just going to come down here, and then you're going to put in your address, oh. 4008, okay. 4008, Mimoso View. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. Good here. So we want to pick active and active under contract? Active, active under contract, pending, and sold, or closed. Closed. Okay. Now, what's the date? Are you going back to like January or something? We haven't gotten there yet. It's oh, cousin. Sorry. Just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> If y'all don't know, Shamile is my cousin. Yeah, Ty is my sister. So <laughs> let's keep it all in the Thomas family. <laughs> all right, so I'm not, no, you're not going to go back a year on closed if you can keep from it. So just active right now? No, no, no. Go active, active under contract, pending, and closed. All right? So that on, so you're on status and you, get, you select all those, right? Everybody good? Mm -hmm. And then you go down here, you see. What opens up below that? You've got pending date, which you're not going to touch. Just leave that alone. And then you got sold date. You see sold date? Mm -hmm. Is that popping up below yeah. there? Okay, you're going to go in there. Now that goes back a year. Mine goes back a year default, and I don't, I don't like that. Okay, so I'm going to go, and it's May 23rd. All right, so I'm going to go back. It just, it kind of depends. I'm not gonna say it's a hard six months. It might be six, seven months, something like that. So I'm gonna go back to, let's say October 1st of 2018 on my sold date from 10-1-2018 to 5-23, and mine says 2029, but it's really 2019. Um, okay, is everybody tra tracking? Would you say again, you chose active, active, uh, under contract, uh -huh. pending, and closed? Yep. All four. That's right. Now here's what's interesting. When you're in a market that's brutal on sellers, brutal, okay, like we were in in 2009, 10, that kind of place, guess what else you would pull up here? Expires. Expires. You know, you know what's up. So 
Yeah, you would pick out because you're going to show them a stack of expireds. These are the people who tried and failed. You don't want to be in this stack, right? Because they're not going to believe. I'm telling you. I'm telling you guys, when it gets hard, it's really hard. It's a hard gig. So what if you have somebody that is in that expired stack? And they're in there because they're stubborn and they don't listen to you or anyone. Yeah. And you run. You just say, yeah. yeah. And then you li then you market around them mm -hmm. and get put your get make sure you try to get a listen to some of yeah. the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Marsh is vengeful, man. I like it. I like it. No, I tell I tell you though, I mean, you're the you know, you're the run you run your own business. So there are people that have huge businesses that they take any listing they can get and they will they just want the sign and they it's something to market and for them it's a uh, it's a win it's not a win for that seller in my opinion but sometimes the sellers are they kind of do it to themselves so you got to figure that out for yourself and I mean in a market where there aren't any listings I'm probably gonna go take a listing now I'm gonna be reasonable enough and I've been doing it long enough where I think I can, for the most part, I don't run into a whole lot of pushback and it's real easy in a seller's market, so much easier to walk into a listing appointment. Because you're not really talking, I mean, price, they're, most of them are gonna be surprised at how much their house is worth. I just sold one for 218, they thought it was worth 185 when I walked in the door. Because I think Zillow said it was worth 185. Mm -hmm. So right now it's, Enjoy your time. Go get a bunch of listings because right now it's a it's a sweet time to be a listing agent. When it when it changes, that's when you got to make decisions on how do I want to spend my time, right? And and you know, I, I will say this: Gene Rivers, who has a way bigger business than anybody in this room uh, and in this company, in our company, um, is in Florida. And when it shifted really heavily, there were people who there were agents who didn't want to do short sales. There were agents who were, were burned out because houses weren't selling and he went and took all that inventory. He took every daggone listing he could take because guess what? When you do that and you actually service those people well, even if their house doesn't sell, so that's when you get into, well, if your house doesn't sell, we've tried it, we've given it, we've given it to college try and we can't get it sold and I know you really want to move, what if we rented your house? Right, you give them an option that they hadn't really thought of. What if I rent your house for you? To help you with that um, I kept clients I kept a client because I I couldn't sell their house normally that means you're out <laughs> right they want to hear from me anymore right but I said hey you know rental markets pretty strong this will be a great rental what do you think about renting it he goes yeah that sounds good this is hilarious we rented it to five nuns <laughs> this is like four or five years ago they're still there the nuns are still there paying every month they're super sweet they don't there's no issues he loves them loves them to death guess what year after we rented it he emails me and says hey wife and I are thinking about moving to Anchorage and I'm going all right we sold I sold him a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house like a few years before that right so I'm, and they had moved from 105,000. So I, I sold their 105, they moved to a 250. I'm going, he's an attorney. I'm like, he's probably gonna buy a five, $600,000 home. He sends me these, these houses that are close to 2 million, some of them. Okay. I'm, like, Maybe. I'm like, hey man, I'm like, this is all well and good, but you know, we do need a pre-approval pre letter even to go look at these. Like, we're not gonna even be able to go see them. Right. Um, you know, I hate to bring that up right away, but that's just the nature of the beast. I hope, I hope that's cool. You know, let's get that together and Go look at some stuff. Sent it over in an hour and bought a $1.3 million home, right? So why did I tell you that story? Because you kept a client. Because you 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 gotta decide what you're you know what you're doing and how you want to function. And like in Gene Rivers' case, everybody was, I don't want to do short sales, I don't want a listing, it's hard to sell, nothing's selling. Gene Rivers was like, I'll take the inventory. Because his point is there's buyers out there for something even in a bad market, and if I got more signs, I'll have more buyers, right? So I'm not saying do, don't do anything, don't do a disservice to a seller ever by telling them that their house is worth more than it's worth. However, if you're very upfront with them and say, hey, market's tough right now, we all know this, 
It's everywhere. We're going to price it here. I think it should be here, but I already told you that, so you now know that. So I'm happy to list it for you here, and we'll do everything we can, and we'll market the absolute junk out of it, <laughs> the best that we can, right? Because if you're marketing, that's the other thing. If you're in a slow market, you're mark and you're out there hustling and doing, you know, you're out there marketing, just going nuts. How many how many more deals are you going to get? Because everybody else is down in the dumps. This is all. That's all like hypothetical. <coughs> that's all like mindset stuff. Right. But you have to make a decision on on how you want to run your business, and um, you don't want to be not. You want to be truthful to a seller, but some of them are just going to be like. I just want you. Can we just try it? And that's when you have to make a decision. Try, try two weeks. And in, and in some cases, you should try. Especially in an up market, you should try it because it could sell. It's probably worth a little more than you are. I think one quick question. Mm -hmm. So you know how you said you sold your buyers the one point three million to um, rent their house. What happened if? Their finances were good because he was an attorney or whatever. Well, he had, this was a flip house, so they were already they were already living in one house. Okay. This so was a flip was, house. Okay. We couldn't sell it. Right. I just gave him an option. You're you're a problem solver. Right. Right. What we don't want is to say, I can't solve your problem. We should just take it off the market. And I'm sorry, I just didn't get the job done. Because then you're never going to get their business again. Right. But if you're upfront with them and you give them options, and you say, hey. Now, you have to be careful, we're not a property management company, so there's very little that I can do for him when I'm, when I'm listing his home for rent. Very little. But I could do that little bit. That being, put it on the MLS, get leads, send him the leads, he shows the property. I happen to have, I mean, I have investment property, so we have a subscription to a company that will run background checks and all that jazz. I gave him some of the stuff that I use, and I said, here, use these for your applications. You give me the application and the money to run the application, I'll run the applications, and I'm literally just sending him info. He's making the decision. So you can do that. Because I get, because I've got- I didn't that. ask, but yeah. I, I've yeah. Got <laughs> the, I got the ability of doing that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, okay, so yeah. Good question though, like what do we do? How do we, you know, should we take it? Should we not? What if they're crazy? You gotta, you gotta figure out how you wanna run. You gotta figure out your own business. When you get to a point where you're, you can be more selective, you're gonna be telling those people no. I don't need, I don't need crazy in my life, right? I got six good clients right now or something. Newer. What if you can offer him to sell his house for Contract mm, instead yeah. of rental. Yeah. You can. You can. Okay. Yeah, just get Harry involved or somebody. You don't want it. You don't want to be. You don't want to be in that business um, if you can keep from it. Uh huh. Okay. Why? I'm just telling you, and and he probably doesn't want to be in that business either. Okay. Now I will say that guy probably does want to be. Anyway, but that's a separate deal. But um, contract for deed is one thing. Like if you're a seller, contract for deed is the better position to be in. Sort of depend. Well, depends. It kind of depends. Eh, I shouldn't say that. it's probably better. Probably equal. A little bit more equal. I think rent to own is a little bit more. Like that's a very that could be very predatory uh, from a seller point of view. Um, I know I know people who will do rent to own all day long, knowing that people will fail. And they want them to fail. And I don't okay, want so that. I don't either. And I don't want to be in that business. Rent to own is different than contract to mm -hmm. deed. Yep. How is it? That's different? a separate separate discussion. How is it different? Rent to own is you are the seller or you're the owner of the property and you do not give up your, you don't give up any interest in the property. Uh -huh. Okay. And they are renting to own your property. So you're going to set them up on some sort of schedule. They're going to pay you X amount of rent for however long. And then at the end of two years or whatever it is, they're going to hopefully be able to uh, qualify for a loan. And if they don't, so you're rent. getting an upfront fee for, mm -hmm. for a lease option or whatever. You're getting an option fee up front, a, a substantial. So a lot of people that might have five or ten thousand dollars but don't have any credit or have bad credit will jump at that. And they'll okay. say, Hey, I'll give you ten grand and then you know, I'm sure it'll all work out in two years. Right? Oh, okay, well I'll stop. But that. if it Rings doesn't if same. it doesn't, then then the seller or the, the person who owns the property has the option to say 
So then keep renting from me or, you know, or hey, you got to pay another option fee. I mean, it's just, it can be very, oh, to me, it's, it can be very predatory. Can they so, get them out? Huh? Can they get them out? There's always a way out, yeah, mm -hmm. in leases, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, it should be, that it should be written that way. If you use a, if you use a professional lease, there should be a way for both parties to get out of anything. Okay. To get out of the, get out of the relationship. Well, that's nice to know. I thought but a, a contract for deed is mm -hmm. where you're actually selling them, yeah. the, the, the person who's renting, mm -hmm. actually will be, have an ownership interest as soon as the documents are signed before they, before they actually do traditional financing. Mm -hmm. So you're giving them a position on the property. And then if you, if you are, um, you have to be careful of this because you're not supposed to practice as though you're a bank. But I think you can do, a, it used to be you could do like one or two or however many, maybe four a year like this where the lending institutions wouldn't, or the lending regulatory people wouldn't look at you as a bank if you were doing that as where you were carrying financing. Mm -hmm. But now they've, they've really, they've kind of tightened up on that. So you have to be careful with that. Okay. So Just steer clear of it if you can. So in a contract of deed, if the option Plus you're not going to get paid. You're not going to get paid until it closes. Why would you want to be in that business? Yeah, too. I mean, but, you know, to give um, sellers and buyers an option. But yep. if, the, if the option is not exercised on the contract of deed, then they lose the option fee. But what about the property that already transferred to the buyer's name? You have to foreclose. Okay. The, who would foreclose? The seller. The seller would foreclose on the buyer that hadn't paid yet. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep, it's a foreclosure. So it's the difference between a foreclosure and an eviction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If somebody wants uh, to We're way off topic, ladies well, and gentlemen. We got, me, we got, got 15 a, minutes. I've got an article okay. that Terry wrote that when someone mentions lease options, all of that stuff, which I personally do not do them and I will not do them. Mm -hmm. I send them that article that Harry wrote mm -hmm. at the end of the conversation. Yeah, I that. talked someone out of that the other day. I, I will put it this I way. I send them that article. I will put it this way. For the both of those scenarios, okay, you're entering into a sophisticated real estate transaction that we don't even know very well. We're the professionals, okay? Guess who's going to come out on the right end of that deal? Like way more win for the seller every time. Okay, so I think you have to assess whether or not you want to be in that or not. And I'm not. There are people that do it. They think it's fine. It's all written out. It's all legit. It's all yada yada. But I'm kind of like, yeah. I think it's a good thing. If I have a client who wants to rent to own, first question is, I'm like, why? Why do you want that? Uh huh. <clears throat> well, I heard. I heard that's a good way. Why? Who told you that? Yeah. You have no idea what you're talking about. Like, help them. Tell them no. You don't want that. Yeah. Let's yeah, get you. Let's get you in credit repair. If that's mm -hmm. the issue, right? Yeah. Marcia. I do credit. Repair. <laughs> what do you do? All right. I, I need Ladies to and gentlemen, okay. we got to get on this. All right. So, All right. your sold date 10 one 2018. Okay. Now look, I got you guys got 66 results. 67. 67. Yeah. All right. Um, fair enough. So that's too many, right? So what am I going to do here? Well, I could go and mess with my, my sold date, which I'm not going to do that yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit, uh, do you all have property subtype in your menu? Mm -hmm. Do you? So we, we are a single family residence. I'm going to click that, see if I'm going to kick out any condos. Oh, and I didn't kick out any condos. So I'm looking for that number 66 to go down. I want it to go drastically down, right? Um, I'm now going to go to, Will, how big is that house? Above ground? 1430. Above ground? Okay, so now I'm gonna go, do you guys have above grade finished? Okay, so above grade finished, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go 1300 minimum, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, how big is it? Sorry, 14? 1430. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go 16. Which is too much. But look, my results dropped down to 32. So I'm getting better. Is it a first floor master? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, Where did you find that at? It, that field? Yeah, do you all have that field? 
Do you have it? Ooh. Yes. Okay. So first floor master, then you're just going to say yes. Is yours a one story or one and a half? That's two? I don't okay. know. What's the difference between them? Well, it, it, the bottom line is there's two floors, and it does have a basement or doesn't? It does. Okay, so. Unfinished. Out of all that information, I'm going to go. Do you all have basement as a field? Yes. Good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say partially finished or walkout finished or walkout unfinished or walkout part finished or unfinished or outside entry or finished. What about not none? I would not put none because we have a basement. Not none. Oh, not none. Even better. You could do that. All right. Yeah, and how do you change that not? You, you click, click on the or. Click on the or and you can change whatever. Okay, you guys see that? So after first floor master, you first get what? Master. What am I looking for? Huh? First floor master, and then what am I looking for? Hit, go to basement. You have basement as a field? Yes. Sorry, are we going too fast? No, we're no, good. No, he was talking to me by saying there's, there's no there. first floor master in this verse. You don't have, okay, so on yours it doesn't have it? General description. So here's here's the beauty of that. You can come down and add a field. You see? Trying. Okay, cool. So where is it? Oh goodness, good luck. Uh, look for it. You're gonna have no, to kind of kind of scan through. So for <laughs> first floor master, you add N N B. So to put unfinished on the basement. I just well, I like what. Um, um, yes, thank you. Gosh, sorry. I like what Lucy said, which you can put, you can, so you see how it says or? Mm -hmm. If you click on or, by none, yeah. see where none is? Click on or, and then say not none. Nice double negative, not none. <laughs> not none basement. Uh, which means we don't want the option of it not having a basement. We want everything that has at least some sort of basement. Right? Yep. So there you go. All right. So I've got, I'm all the way down to 11. Mm -hmm. All right. So click your, 11 is a great number for me to scan through and see what I like. Now, what I didn't tell you guys is um, normally what I would do is I would have this pulled up. Like if I go, if I'm looking at, um, let's say I, your house isn't listed yet, yours, and I have an address. And maybe I have an old MLS listing. That's ideal. So I go in, I'll search that address, right? And I'll find the old MLS listing. And now I've got some data to look at. I, now I know a little bit about the house, okay? Um, and assuming now, the best thing to do in an area where you feel like there could be an addition or they may have updated it a lot or whatever, best thing to do is talk to the seller, right? You talk to that seller. I'm coming out to your house on Thursday. I just want to ask you a couple questions about your home. You've been there since 2015. Have you put on any additions? Nope, no additions. Okay, cool. Uh, is there anything major that you've done remodeling wise? Trust me, they, they love talking. Do they like talking about their remodel? Yes, they love talking about what they've done. They're going to tell you everything, probably too much. All right, so you're going to make some notes and you're going to note anything that's super major. Like, oh, we did a whole kitchen remodel. Oh, cool, awesome. Well, tell me about that. What'd you do? New cabinets, granite, whatever, right? Just make some notes, that way you've got a better idea before you even go out. That way you can whittle your comps down even more, okay? Um, all right, so I got 11, I'm gonna look at my 11. So I'm gonna click on view results. And, I, and I'm looking here, I got um, 3913 Pin Oak View. <coughs> it's pretty similar in size, 1480, and is an unfinished basement. I love this one, this is a great comp. Three bed, two full bath. Okay. Oh, what I was gonna say though is if you have an old listing, you're gonna have that that window, you could have that open, right? Where is your listing? Will? It's not on yet. It's not on Oh, it's not. Place. Okay. So even better. All right, so uh, we're kind of too late, but what I would have done is start off, find the old listing, and then you can you can open that as a window. It's a separate window. All right, that way you've got that sitting there and you can kind of refer back and forth. That way you kind of know what it looks like. We don't really know, I'm not really worried about it because this is all hypothetical, but what I would do is, I'm looking at Pin Oak and I'm going, that's a great comp, I want that one. So I click, 
I click the check box, right? Now the next one for me is the one on Taylorsville Road. Now knowing knowing that my house looks a lot more like Pin Oak and is more more the age of Pin Oak, is Taylorsville Road even a comp? Mm -hmm. No. Thank you. Good. Yes. Who's asking? You can still open a new window if you want. Okay. How do you do that? So you go to the search bar, to the main search bar on the top of the page, mm -hmm. and you start typing four zero zero eight Mimosa, and it should show you a drop down. With oh, new tab. Yeah. You're yeah. awesome, man. Lu there. Lucy, rock and roll. All right. So now I've got the pick. Now I kind of know what it looks like. Oh, right. Good. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what did, what did she say again? So if you go, you know the top bar there where it says enter an address, zip, zip, I'm sorry, city, zip, MLS number, blah, 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 you see that? Uh, Here. Where, where did you go? Right here, oh, yours oh, is down and way. Get rid of that down and way. Yeah. Now, now say 4008. Okay. And then see, see what pops up. Yeah. And then you're gonna hit new tab. Lucy saving the day. Love it. So, all right, so now I've at least got something to go on here, right? And if you're. Now, it doesn't have any old pictures, unfortunately. Some of them will have old pictures, so you can kind of get a better feel for what's going on, too. Uh, this one doesn't. So, at least, but at least I know what it looks like. Now, now, now that I see it. <clears throat> I don't love Pin Oak View as a comp. I don't love it. I don't think it looks that similar. But size-wise, first floor master, yada, yada, unfinished basement, pretty similar. Now, yours has one car garage, right? Mm -hmm. And it has a two. So our comp has a two. And it's 197.9. It's active under contract. And it's been 45 days on market. Okay, those are the things I'm looking at. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to look at the picks and make sure it's not... You know supernaturally gifted or anything it's very average okay this is this is very uh, run-of-the-mill for spring view okay the kitchen's maybe a little bit updated I don't know if that's a new countertop or something but it's not this is all this is all not nothing's unbelievable okay makes sense but that's what I'm looking for I want to know is there something really amazing going on with this house that would make me not pick it if I get in mine and it's it's just average. Well, this one's very average, okay? All right, then Truman Way, that's not a comp. We know that, right? But that is a, see, see so this, this neighborhood vantage point, that, that's a neighborhood that uh, adjoins uh, Springview. So this is what, this is the discussion we had at the beginning. Like, you know, listing agent wants, <laughs> wants the appraiser to go outside of the neighborhood to get this comp, and it doesn't look anything like my house, and it's got brick on it, and it's all that. So, anywho, Bell Tower, not a comp. St. Rene, not a comp. West Wago, not a comp. Furview Court, now that looks a little bit more like my house. Okay? All right, and it sold for a lot too, which is sweet. So it's 222.7. Why on earth did that sell for so much? That's what I'm asking, right? So I'm gonna look at the picks. Yep, and it's got, a, it's got some updates. The kitchen is a little bit funky in a cool way. Um, it's got, looks like some hardwood floor. Man, they had some bold taste. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Kind of surprising that, you know, that went that high. Yeah. Somebody liked it. But somebody, they got the right buyer and it only took two days on the market. Mm -hmm. Right? But it's a one car garage. It, it really checks all the boxes except it's got that 518 oh. square feet in the basement. And it's a four bed, which is, we're not a four bed, right? No. How is that a four bed? It's got, finished it says it's got three bedrooms on the second floor. Which one did you say you like the, the best comp or the best match? Well, 10503 Furview is the one I'm looking at. I'm not saying okay. it's the best, okay. but it is. I would see two beds. It's four beds, so that, that, one I, that one I may kick that out because of that, and then I may head over here to Pineview. I'll hit Pineview. Pineview is three bed, two full bath, similar square footage on the first floor, or first two floors, and then you've got a little finish in the basement. So that's got a big yard. It's got a big yard, which is which is rare over in that neighborhood. The interior is a little above average. It's been updated to some degree, okay? 
Now, here's the other thing, but there's no pictures of the basement, which is odd, since it's finished. Um, which, which is unfortunate because what I want to know is kind of what kind of quality is the basement, right? Like what kind of finish is it? Is it a good finish? Is it a barely finish? What is it? All right, that's pretty much it. That's amazing. So that's it for spring view, okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so here's the thing. You got 197.9 and then you got 222 and 211. So did you pick two houses or one? Because I had, I had found two. I got it. I picked three. Oh, which one? So I, got I went ahead and picked the Pine View one. Now, really, in 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 all, here's the thing. If I, if I were okay, we just did that so that you could learn how to do a radius search. And right. probably need to be in neighborhood. Yeah, I would have just hit Spring View, and if I have to, if I have to like widen a few little parameters to get one or two, I'm never going to not have enough comps in Spring View. I'm always going to have comps. Okay, so. These might not be the very best that I would pick, um, but I, I just, you guys needed to see how to do a, uh, a radius, okay? Now you know how to do a radius. That's as far as we got today. I don't know what else to tell you, sorry. We appreciate you. Uh, where else, what, what else did we not see? Look at this, zip code search, neighborhood search, polygon is awesome. Gets, gets into a lot of fun stuff there. Selecting comps. So once you figure out which ones, then what do you do? You know what it is? Once you figure out which ones? Yeah. Um, it depends on what I'm looking at. Because like these last three, where would you go to now just to see? Well, I would make sure I've selected them and then I've got my three selected, right? You see that up there next to results? Well, I got two, but yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I've got three. I'm gonna save those. Okay, now really what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back out of this whole thing and I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna do a neighborhood search for spring. <clears throat> That's really what I'm gonna do. Yeah. Okay, but we don't have time for that. So you save them? I would save them. So you go up to save and it says save selected as. Uh -huh. <clears throat> if you save selected as, you can call them a collection. So now you have a listing collection. Uh -huh. I would call that, you know, uh, 4008 uh, Mimosa View Pumps. Right? Now I've got those saved, and then I can go back in and mess around and see what I want to do. If you, um, where you get real nerdy is when you can go in and do like a manual, like deal, like a manual CMA, mm -hmm. and you can do like adjustments. So you can take, you can add, add value for certain things, take away value for things. Yeah. We don't have, we might do that in Spring View at this point because there's enough of them that have been updated that really comes into play like when you have a bunch of variances. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not setting these to like average Okay. Alright, so I'm not gonna save those. I'm just gonna take these three. Okay? And now I'm just gonna hit um, CMA. Did you do that? No. Okay. Okay now it says what? Use all results, you select, it doesn't really matter. Mine are selected. So use all results, okay? Well now I've got these three options. If I want, I can do this, which, um, let me see here. The thing, okay, this one allows you to make adjustments. Thank you. Okay, you bet. This one is a